This is Fresh Tracks Weekly. I've had basically one thing on my mind this week, and it's bighorn sheep. I drew a sheep tag in Montana. So I am just jacked, and that's all I can think about. And because of that, that's also going to be the inspiration for the deeper dive this week, where we're going to talk about the big three in Montana, which is bighorn sheep, moose, and mountain goat. Um, but yeah, 22nd year applying, and I was still extremely lucky to draw the tag. Many people apply for bighorn sheep their entire life and never get a chance to do it. That being said, I did try to stack the odds in my favor by applying for an extremely tough unit. It's not an easy hunt. There are unfilled tags most years here. The sheep are often deep in the backcountry, which just makes it that much more exciting to me. I'm yeah, super pumped about it. I've had a fascination with bighorn sheep for a long time. When I was an undergrad, I worked on a field crew researching sheep and mountain goats. Uh, we got to spend the summer and fall in the high country tracking them with radio telemetry equipment, doing surveys, and I even got to help out with a few captures where they sampled for diseases and put radio collars and GPS collars on them. And then when I went on to do my master's in film, I kept working with bighorn sheep. Multiple of my friends were doing their master's projects in wildlife and still working on the bighorn sheep research. So I got to keep my hands in it every now and then helping out with stuff. And then I made multiple short films on bighorns throughout my masters. But yeah, and I just continue to be fascinated by them. Every summer, Karen and I go backpacking pretty much every weekend. And I always have my optics with me looking for bighorn sheep, seeing where, trying to figure out where their summer ranges are. Uh, and then in the winter, we also drive to multiple winter ranges just to see how they're doing. Pretty cool to go to the winter ranges and see what rams show up because they're so hard to find in the summer and fall, but you know that they're there somewhere because here they are in the winter down in the low country. But once they move up high, there are so many hidey holes and it just like, it, it adds to that level of intrigue to me, just trying to figure out where these guys go. So super excited about that. I have a lot of trips planned already this summer to go scouting and uh, just looking for bighorns, super stoked. So keep in mind my level of excitement as we go into the first news story, which I found out about last night when Jace messaged me, showing me a press release where Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks messed up the bighorn sheep and moose draw in Montana. So I was losing my cool there for a second, um, still am, it's not cool. Really, really not cool. They gave out too many bighorn sheep tags in several districts and too many moose tags in several districts. So FWP in their statement said that they will be taking back the over allocation of tags, which includes some bighorn U permits, some very sought after moose permits, and one of the most sought after bighorn ram units in the state. But with species like this that exist in such low densities, you cannot over allocate tags. The quotas are carefully chosen each year by biologists based on what they're seeing in the field. So I'm glad that at least they're putting the resource first and they won't allow these extra quotas to be filled. Again, really not good. Keep in mind, the draw had been out for five days before they announced the mess up. In that amount of time, I had had one of the biggest dopamine rushes of my life. I had talked to two previous tag holders. I had went out and glassed and found multiple rams. I had planned a solid 10 backpacking trips for the summer. I had met with the biologist for an hour and a half. And uh, yeah, so after doing all that, I can only imagine getting the tag taken away, which did happen to several really unfortunate people. I was lucky that it didn't affect me, but what a horrible feeling for the people who were affected, who are likely waiting for this opportunity their entire life, and then to only get a, oh, sorry, just kidding, that's not actually your permit. Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks has had some big mess ups in the last couple of years. They gave out too many elk tags last year in certain areas. Their app this year had duplicates of turkey tags for the first week and a half of turkey season. Uh, and they never addressed that one either. If this seems anything to do with technology or licensing or the draw, they can't handle. For the most part, our state agency does amazing work in the biological realm, so we have to give them credit for that. But technology, it's just not their strong suit. So hopefully this is a wake up call. Probably not. I don't know. Anyway, we gotta go check in and see what Michael has going on in the fishing corner. Hello boys and girls, welcome back to the fishing corner. I'm your host, Mike P. It's episode 41, Fresh Tracks Weekly. I can't believe it. Weekly, we're doing this, guys. Welcome back. Hey, so I don't have anything on my screen for you to look at, but Anything Goes went out this week. Episode 
It was a carp episode. So it was the second episode of season two. You should go out and watch it. You should share it with your friends because it's content that's sweet. And if you like fishing, I think you'll like it. So a little update on what I've been up to. 54 days of fishing so far in 2023. Last week, after we talked last on or last episode of Fresh Tracks Weekly, went out, did some bass fishing, got skunked, laid a big old zero. Next couple of days, high water nymphing with my girlfriend Cassie. It was great. The fishing was amazing. There's nothing to be intimidated about with high dirty water when you're trout fishing. Um, my advice would be fish close to the bank, those current seams, and you can have a really good day. I think next week I'm going to do this out on the water and kind of just show you guys what's going on because Marcus could be gone. Randy's going to be gone. It's just going to be me. I'm going to host Fresh Tracks Weekly. It's going to be amazing. And that's all I really got for the fishing corner, I think, this week. Not a whole lot, but it's getting warm across the west, so all those rivers are going to rise. Anytime you're fishing a river system, whether you're fishing smallmouth, trout, et cetera, like they get on those current seams right next to the bank, fish in the bushes. You'll catch them. Thanks for watching. I love you guys. We'll see you next week. All right, back to some news. In Nevada, a bill has been working through the legislature to designate the wild Mustang as the state horse of Nevada. I had to touch on this one because in last week's episode, we talked about non-native species and briefly touched on feral horses and how destructive they've been to the rangeland and competing with native wildlife. So knowing that, it makes one wonder, why would you want to make the wild Mustang Nevada's state horse? Well, because a group of fourth graders thought it was a cool idea and were learning about the public process and wrote letters to a state legislator to make it happen. Most likely not a malicious attempt at the beginning, but it has snowballed and wild horse advocacy groups are backing the bill, wanting to place the wild horse up on a pedestal and utilizing its status to promote tourism to the state and just improve public perception of wild horses. So the bill was recently read in front of the Assembly Committee of Government Affairs, and there was some pretty emotional arguments on both sides. I will say that from my perspective, those in opposition to the bill seem to be grounded much more in logical reason, citing facts and science. The Nevada Department of Wildlife testified in opposition along with numerous groups and individuals. In total, 1,150 individuals submitted comments in opposition to the bill. The people in support thought that wild mustangs are an icon of Nevada and need to be recognized as such. Uh, the people in opposition worry that placing these horses up on a pedestal will further the already difficult discussion of horses' impact on the ecosystem. The committee adjourned without action, so we're unsure of the future of this bill. We'll have to keep watching and find out. A new study recently published in Ecosphere looked at migratory behaviors of elk in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and what strategies enabled greater resiliency. So they compiled a ton of data from 20 elk herds over 14 years with input from some of the leading elk researchers. They categorized elk as either being residents, basically staying in the same spot, or short distant migrants, long distant migrants, or elevation migrants. Around 50% of the elk fell into the category of being short distant migrants, while 20% were long distant migrants and another 20% were elevational migrants, and then about 5% were those elk that just stayed in the same zone. So then they looked at how often and which elk would switch up their migration tactic. So there's a lot of interesting information and insight throughout the study, and it's definitely worth a read, but here are the super boiled down findings that I found interesting. So the elk that were more readily able to switch their tactic up were more resilient. Basically, the elk that adapt do better than those that are too stubborn and do the same thing regardless of conditions. That being said, you don't necessarily want to leave these stubborn, non-adaptable elk behind. We still want to understand what can we do to make those elk be successful as well. The key takeaways for management were to promote things that keep the cultural knowledge of elk migration alive. It provides further evidence that we should strive to protect critical winter range and migratory routes for each different migration tactic does make one wonder if over time, if these elk that are more adaptable are the ones that are surviving, what does that mean for the distribution of elk across the landscape and how they use that landscape? I'm speculating a bit here, but what if that means that the elk that are adaptive are more often utilizing private and accessible lands versus land that is open and accessible to hunters? or maybe they are more concentrated across the landscape and not using as much of the habitat as they were before. A lot of things to think about. 
Our deeper dive this week is on the future of moose, sheep, and goats in Montana, how populations are trending down, applications are trending up, what we know, and what we wish we knew. Welcome back to Fresh Tracks Weekly, episode 41. Yeah. Yeah. And Michael, you, you going to charge us extra for that voice rendition? And Free 99. Okay. Free 99. Bill. Thanks for the job, Randy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the job. You might be firing me soon, though, because I, really? I don't know if I'm going to be a very good employee uh, this upcoming season. Really? What happened, Marcus? <laughs> I have Please one thing tell. on my brain. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, dis- I, the only reason I'd fire you, Marcus, is because you drew a sheep tag before I did. <laughs> I and know. I'm just, I'm I just know. jealous. And before my dad, I think my dad has about twice as many years applying for a sheep tag as I did. But yeah. I still had 20, 23 years. That's, That's 20, a lot. 23rd year applying. Yeah. I I totaled up all the sheep applications that I've done and Matthew have done across all the states. We're pushing 270 right now. Dang. And we have never drawn a sheep tag. That's wild. <laughs> Yeah. So Marcus drew a sheep tag this week. Yeah, <laughs> we found out what was it yesterday or no? You drew it was it was last, Friday. last Friday. Yeah, and then tell everybody else what happened today. Oh, I also drew an elk tag in Wyoming. Yeah, which might be a good one. It's a brand new season, so yeah. we'll see. We'll find out. It's exciting. This guy. You guys draw Just, anything? I haven't no, drawn anything. I didn't draw anything. I, Nothing. I'm a little worried about. All of this. Huh. It's just, it seems like a lot of good going on right now. Yeah, I feel you, like I, it's making me nervous. Every, things are, oh, are no, going you, you too well it. for me. No, you deserve it. Welcome. Know. Or not welcome, but congratulations. That's <laughs> what I meant to say. Oh. Like when, when our buddy Bart May drew his sheep tag, I told Kim, I said, Bart drew a sheep tag. She says, well, he deserves it. <laughs> and so on Friday, I said, Marcus drew a sheep tag. She's like, oh, yeah, he deserves it, too. <laughs> Which, <laughs> well, that's nice to like, say. <laughs> uh, what, what about me, darling? I'm, I'm, <sighs> oh, well. We got to insert the clip of you of, of Marcus finding out that he drew the tag. It's pretty hilarious. Yeah. And Randy's just like, woo <laughs> Get the quarter. Uh. Pretty jacked. Yeah. yeah. But I did put in for a tag that has a lot better odds. So that was, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of right. some of the tags in Montana are – very dismal odds, and this one's a little harder to draw. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, let's face it. I put in for one where the odds are one percent. Your odds were what seven or eight percent, maybe. Yeah, maybe like that. D- so with all the points I had, but yeah. So over the law of large numbers, I need to live to be a hundred to draw. When I kind of hit it perfect because they started doing the bonus points in Montana the first year that I could apply, so I really hit it pretty perfectly. So I was on the even playing field with you, even though you've been applying longer. Mm, so. Yeah, it's interesting. But Matthew is the same age as you, so he hit it perfectly too. Yeah, that's and that's true. why he drew a moose tag his last year. Right. After 17 years, he drew a moose tag. Yeah. And I hadn't drawn a moose tag, so. It's exciting. But oh, well. pretty sweet, man. Happy for you. But is that what we're here to talk about? Just well, how lucky kinda- Marcus is? Uh, well, it kinda, <laughs> yeah. it's a, a segue into the discussion uh, you uh-huh. brought up. is mostly based off a of thread started on Hunt Talk yeah. that brought light to a thing that we kind of, we, we know, but it's right. interesting to see it in graph form. Yeah, and Brett told me we can use that graphic that he put up there. Okay, cool. So, um, But, yeah, basically looking at the big three in Montana. So what we call the big three is moose, sheep, and mountain goat. Yep. And... Um, they're pretty sought after permits if you're unaware. They're very exciting to get. They're, I, I mean, thousands of people put in every year. But this graph shows the trajectory from 2006 to 2022 of the available permits trending downward while the number of applicants are trending upward. Yep. Which just makes the odds worse. But then also, it's like what's happening to these populations is the real question that concerns us i think yeah and you guys have heard me phrase that in a more simplistic way where i always say if you want to double your odds put twice as many animals on the hill right and i always talk about that mostly in the context of the big three because there are so few of them and they're so sought after right but in montana in the time i've lived here just seeing the numbers of permits a reflection of the herds going down and down and down it's very troubling yeah and it's not, it's not like range or statewide though. It's not like every district is trending the same, which is interesting. So, 
like for instance, in the Missouri breaks, like the sheep, like if you look at the uh, long-term average, the numbers have been going up quite a bit. And then same with mountain goats in a lot of their non-native ranges. And we actually, we mentioned this in the last episode, how mountain goats are doing well in a lot of the non-native mountain ranges, but in the ranges that they've lived in for hundreds of years, not so well. And so that there's a lot of unanswered questions. There's some things we know, and there's a lot we don't know. Um, but yeah, I don't. I almost feel bad. Like Randy was mentioning that, I'm like, man, I kind of feel bad. No, for no, no, no. Don't feel bad. <laughs> no it, but for folks who don't know, Marcus has spent a lot of time involved in sheep conservation. He spent a lot of time in this area where these sheep are at. So, to Kim Newberg's statement that he <laughs> deserves it. <laughs> You would deserve a sheep tag there way more than I ever would because I, I've not, I mean, I've been involved in sheep things, but not to the degree you have. In that yeah, area. I don't know how involved I've been. I've made a lot of short films and have been very curious and inquisitive about that area. And Don't feel guilty. Um, but yeah. I, I don't think anybody, you think anyone else who drew a moose goat or sheep tag that last week felt guilty? <laughs> Probably not. You shouldn't. No. Um, so like with sheep, it's, there's a lot of disease. Yeah, and so. then like, but so like, I'm kind of curious. Like, what about moose? Like, is that disease. like disease, yeah. disease and parasites? Yeah, parasites. And I, there's a lot of you know, with warming climates, it's just like more ticks, which is a big problem. Like yeah. tick paralysis, and then arterial, arterial worm. worm, and a lot of that's Wait, correlated. What worm, worm, arterial. It's an arterial uh, worm. It gets in their arteries, and it messes up their their uh, cardiac and and other. Uh, issues so we're having issues with ticks as well here in montana at like just like because isn't like in the northeast they're just getting crushed by ticks <laughs> yep yeah and so i mean like when you don't get those cold snaps that just absolutely you know that just kind of wipe out the tick population yeah that's a big part of it and then just yeah habitat changes like this warming stuff definitely affects moose yeah um, and when you guys were on my moose hunt in 2021 they give you a pamphlet, tell you how to check for ticks and how many you observe. They give you a pamphlet of how to look for certain signs that will show there's arterial worm, uh, like their ears and stuff or the extremities, the blood flow will not be as normal. And so you'll see problems there. Uh, well, you were there on Matthew's hunt. Yeah. Remember when he had the moose tag and we were looking for a lot of things oh, on, yeah. on that. And so Game and Fish uses hunters... We, we almost, I, I, this is the fun part about those kind of hunts. You almost are a little bit of a field data gatherer. Right. Yeah. And the biologists appreciate it. It's a, yeah. it's a pretty cool, you know, opportunity to be a citizen hunter scientist, you know, yeah. just like contribute a little bit of data. It's yeah. Pretty, pretty cool. And then with moose too, as much as we joke about uh, wolves often, wolves did put a ham, like hammered moose in a lot of districts. Um, I think it was just like, I don't know whether it was they were just naive to that predator being absent for so long, but the wolves really knocked them back in some districts. And it seems like that's maybe leveling out and they're figuring it out a little bit now. But for a while, they, like, really, really hammered them. Yeah, and not that anyone was on the Lewis and Clark expedition was a trained scientist and they didn't call her any moose, but the number of moose they saw in Montana was, in Idaho was close to zero. Really? And so... It begs the question of, did we, it, w was this historic Chirus moose habitat to the degree that we had numbers gotcha. when we came and then manipulated landscapes with logging and right. agriculture and dams and all these other things we did? Was that an artificial spike? Right. And now we're seeing a maturation of landscapes again back to an older stage. And so it's, is that? Part of what it is, that, and we've had, sure we, there was a, artificial spikes in in elk for sure in certain areas too. Yeah. But I mean, you know, that's again, this is like isolated zones where this happens. But yeah, so that's definitely an interesting aspect to it that that could be. Yeah, I I, I mean, when you look at the swath of disease issues and parasite issues happening to a lot of wildlife, it's hard to isolate it as though it's just happening in. Montana, so it's got to be a Montana landscape issue. You know, it's happening in Minnesota and southern Canada. It's happening in British Columbia. It's like, all right, there's a lot bigger pieces involved here than just one little thing we might grab onto. Right. Yeah, and, like, to me, it's just, like, 
this very curious about what we can potentially do. There's a lot of things that are outside of our control, but there are things that are inside our control. And there's like a ton of effort going in to both, to all three really. But moose, there's a big statewide study going on with moose right now that's looking into the causes. And I don't know what the management implications are there though. Like other than, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I I really don't. And then uh, with sheep, with disease, they have all sorts of different stuff they're experimenting with. But the pneumonia knocks down the sheep. So you see quite a few cyclical patterns in sheep populations. But unfortunately, in a lot of them, it's trending down. Is the pneumonia last. from uh, domestic sheep? Or it, is that like Yeah, a, a so it, it can be for sure. Yeah, that's like one of the, I mean, the very simplistic way of putting it is when you put domestic, put wild sheep with domestic sheep, the wild sheep die like very often. And there's all sorts of, you know, theories of what exactly is causing that. But they've um, they've linked it to, like, this MOV pathogen is, like, one of the biggest, biggest reasons that they, when they get that, that you're usually due for a die-off. Um, but the... MOV is, like, a type of... Mycoplasma ovin pneumonia. It's, like, it's a, like type a type of, of pneumonia. It's just, like, this pathogen that triggers pneumonia. But it's usually, like, it'll be present in the populations, but then there's some other factor that like triggers the die off, whether it's like some weather event or some uh, other pathogen that mixes with it. And they're still not entirely sure, but like a lot of the studies that have been come out and say, you know, like once they have this pathogen, like they're probably going to have a die off at some point, but the break sheep, most, a lot of them have it that they've tested and they haven't had a die off yet. Well, how long have they like known that they've had it? Uh, like long time. A while. I'm trying to think of, like, when they started the statewide research. Yeah, seven or eight years probably. But then, so they transplanted the sheep from the Missouri Breaks. That I think, well, neither of you guys, Dale and Jay Spears, went and filmed the transplant. Yeah. They transplanted sheep from Missouri Breaks to the Little Belt Mountains. And then when they, once they got to the Little Belt Mountains, quite a few of them died from pneumonia. Hmm. Or they and so it's like what so happened? It could be like an environmental thing. Maybe could be like a, I don't know. There's so many. Un- that's the thing. Is there's so many unanswered questions. And then also mountain lions killed a ton of them, and the little belts. The was, grass is greener. Which is unfortunate. In the breaks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> would it be that the breaks are a little easier living? And maybe that's the thing. Or it's like maybe. is the added stress of the predator like more predation? Maybe like that added stressor like also or the added increased. stress of being captured from a helicopter. Yeah. Yeah. And drive well, it in a trailer. But the, the thing is, <laughs> it's like down the highway. They, had, they, they had done quite a few uh, capture collar studies where, you know, they captured and collared sheep in the brakes and then them released them in the brakes. So they're, but those ones, you know, they didn't, so that they had that stressor and they never had gotcha. a die off from pneumonia. Yeah. No, no right hate now. to FWP. I'm just, <laughs> so I'm just what, one of the challenges. Yeah, yeah, no, you bring up a good point, yeah. like for sure. When we look at these charts, one of the challenges is that these species will never pay for themselves and their management. You can't give away 190 or 220 tags, and most of them go to residents. And what what did you pay for your tag, Marcus? 125 dollars. Yeah, at 127 so cool. something. How to <laughs> so, pay that processing fee? <laughs> yeah. So the these programs will never pay for themselves. Right. They get subsidized by a couple things they get subsidized by game programs that actually make money like elk and deer they get subsidized by our general license revenues by our Pittman robertson and other excise tax revenues so uh, asking around if you of those big three which one would you want michael uh sheep sheep yeah would you pay 300 dollars as a resident if oh absolutely jay would which would you want i'd probably say sheep as well and I'd be, I mean, as a resident, I'd be willing to pay, shoot, 800 bucks. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Marcus, give me the tag. <laughs> if, if they said, you drew the sheep tag, but here's what the price is, where would they have priced you out? It would have been a lot. I, I, <laughs> Marcus, I would go into debt. Like, I have a problem. I degenerately gamble with, with uh, sheep applicant. applications and, <laughs> and raffle tickets on sheep. Yeah. Like, new, or, uh, yeah, New Mexico is a prime example where I was willing to spend the whatever it was, thirty four hundred dollars. You put up you have to put up thirty four hundred dollars to be included in the application, which I would have paid if I could have gotten a desert sheep day. <laughs> so you get we, that money we, refunded, we, but like, we aren't pricing markets yeah, out of the sheep yeah. market. But my point of this is that we're never going to fund these programs. 
for these three species. So how do we improve the habitat? How do we improve the numbers? In Montana, for each of them, we have one auction tag. Right. And that is earmarked money that goes to that species. Now, some states, they give away lots of auction tags. But for the sake of this discussion, that's one thing in Montana that we do to help fund research and other stuff. And then they usually use that money to leverage PR, Pittman Robertson dollars and everything else as well. Right. But then you think about how much of the work gets done by volunteers. For sure. The Rocky Mountain Goat Alliance is going out. And doing surveys this summer. I'm, I'm on their email list. They are already got a bunch of surveys. We went and filmed one in the Bridgers. They do them all around Montana. Mm-hmm. A lot of this is happening not necessarily by funding. It's happening by volunteerism. It's happening by just... Yeah. Well, and some of it isn't happening is maybe the answer there. Right. But no, nonprofits do great work and fundraising and you know facilitating citizen science and then also helping get research projects off and grounds and uh, yeah. you know various ways yeah for it, sure i'm I, I always when i joke that you know if you want to double your odds put twice as many sheep or goats or whatever on the mountain it's easy for me to say that but how do we do that that's that's the riddle we solve or have to solve, if we're going to have a bright future for these three species, and I don't care if it's Montana, wherever, how are we going to solve that? Because all the time and energy, all these Ponzi schemes about how to reallocate the tags, that's not creating more opportunity. Right. Are we going to just sit here and fight over the last, how do I get the last tag while the numbers continue on the trend in those charts of the last 20 years? Or are we going to say, you know what? We'll pay more. We'll have higher application fees. We'll have whatever it is. Right. So that these numbers can start building back up. Yeah. And I think especially that is especially true with goats and moose because I feel like they're probably, I mean, there's some great research going on with both those species, but potentially underfunded. And honestly, I'm not sure, but I found it really interesting. So at the Montana Wild Sheep Foundation uh, banquet this year, they had what they called like the the state of the sheep. And so they had various biologists and people from FWP come and present on what was going on in Montana with the sheep. And it's a unique point in history right now where they have the funding right now for sheep research. So it's really cool to like have the funding to put forward to these projects. So that's really exciting and hopefully start answering more of these unanswered questions of what's going on. How do we help? What, you know, how do we stop the disease or is there immunity building in certain herds? There's, there's just a lot that we don't understand and it takes money. It takes funding. It takes people on the ground to figure it out. Yeah. Um, And and for sheep, it's a little bit different because the sheep are a political animal. Yeah. You, you don't have nearly the politics around moose and mountain goat that you have around sheep. And in Montana, if you look at our native range of where Rocky Mountain bighorns live versus where they live today, it's a fraction. Oh, for sure. And there's lots of reasons. There's some scientific reasons, but there's a lot of political reasons why we aren't allowed to have sheep in a lot of our premium range. So my question to the audience is, are we willing to stand up and, and fight those political battles right. on behalf of wild sheep or whatever it will take for moose or whatever it will take for mountain goats? Yeah. Yeah. That's the question. Because, we, you, you know, I'll be in the dirt in 20 years, but you guys will be looking at these same charts, and I hope that they don't continue on this slow decline like yeah. they have. No, it's definitely discouraging, and especially when it's stuff that's outside your control, like, you know, weather events. It's not like we can really manipulate the weather. I don't know. I don't know. And then mountain goats, that one's really interesting to me because I feel like it's just... Yeah, why? Why? Like, their habitat has not seen significant changes. Like, that's one place that, like, you know, it's not like we're... We, plowed fields up in the alpine yeah. and we like <laughs> changed everything up there so like what is it is it climatic maybe i don't know I, though. right i don't think we know and it's just like especially when they're blowing up and they're non-native mountain ranges right are they're going crazy in yellowstone and grand teton yeah but so, why 
I, I, mean, I, so I don't weird. know. I, I bet you there's a lot of biologists asking that same question because where we live in Region 3, Southwest Montana, this is not native mountain goat habitat. Right. But they're doing very well here. You get to the native mountain goat habitat in Northwest Montana and they're in the crapper. Mm-hmm. Why? <laughs> to your point. Maybe it's because we brought back all the, you know, we saved all the eagles. Like, that's it. That's my new theory. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, when we stopped using DDT and brought back all the, the bald eagles and golden eagles, and uh-huh. they're killing all the mountain goats. This is, ba- <laughs> this is based yeah, on absolutely nothing. This is a joke. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is a joke, folks. <laughs> just, just spitballing here. Uh, <laughs> we need, we need well, to study that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, and we get into the, the, so that's the supply side. There's the demand side. There's out, There's been growing demand for these no matter when you chart this. Uh, how early in time you want to chart the demand for moose, goat, and sheep in Montana, it's on an uphill slide. And I sat on the committee that came up with our point scheme, Ponzi scheme. That did nothing. They The statisticians told us in those meetings all these point schemes you're talking about do nothing to increase the odds in total. Unless you bring more supply, you are never going to, I don't care what system you come up with. It's not going to help your draw odds. Yeah. It, it decreases the draw odds for people just getting into it. Right. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's, that's right. one thing that point systems do. Yeah. And, you know, you look at 2014, Montana said you no longer have to front the $125. I think then it was 75 bucks. Right. All of a sudden you saw like a 20% increase that year. And it's just grown from there. So you can come up with all kinds of things that address the demand side. But until you address the supply side of how many animals are out there in the hills. Right. You're, you're really just rearranging the furniture. <laughs> Or maybe even getting rid of some furniture. <laughs> right. Yeah, I guess my, my mind just always goes back to, like, how can we, you know, research and try to understand more. Um, that's And like you said, like, especially with sheep, you know, making your voice heard in terms of the political battles that need to be fought and just, like. Yeah, and jo- join those groups. I don't know of a moose group, but. Yeah, I was going to ask about if you the moose, can, like. Join your state chapter of the the wild sheep groups. Join the Rocky Mountain Goat Alliance. You know, even if it's twenty bucks, thirty bucks, whatever the membership is, it helps, and it gives them numbers. So when they're sitting at a table trying to advocate for that species, it helps. But I don't know of one. It's a moose Let's organization. The Shires Moose Foundation. Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really don't. You want to yeah. know it's going to be a really good uh, laboratory experiment is not that I want this to happen, but moose populations are booming in Colorado. Yeah. Mm. They're about ready to be introduced to a new predator. Right. It will be interesting to see. if I, I hope Colorado has baseline data so when this experiment with wolves takes place, they have data that, to then measure because, like you pointed out, they didn't, uh, of all the species, they're the ones who really took it on the on the chin when wolves were yeah. introduced. When it's such a low density animal. And I think like, I don't know if it was just what factors led to them just really keying on keying in on moose in certain areas, but they really did. But, yeah. Um, I think it's range wide though. It sounds like the, the ticks, the, the yeah. habitat changes and the, yeah. I mean, um, Bo- arterial Bo- warmer. Gallatin County, Bozeman, Belgrade, Three Forks, Manhattan. This used to be some of the best willow ground in all of North America. Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine how many moose lived here at one time? Or yeah. could have lived here? I don't know. I don't know why Lewis and Clark didn't see any when they were coming through here, maybe. But. So, what the habitat change of civilization. You know, that's Yeah. Yeah, it's good. No doubt. How do we measure that? $300 for your sheep tag, eh, Michael? Well, oh, I mean, I'd easily pay pay three hundred dollars. So I'd pay a lot more than that. I don't yeah. know if I'd be paying like three thousand dollars, but I'd probably pay like <laughs> twelve hundred bucks for a sheep tag for sure. You're yeah. you're a little bit more of a of a well behaved investor of your money yeah, than yeah, our, yeah. our degenerate well, gambler here. Well, and I don't want to discount the fact that, like, I mean, I think it 
I like the fact that it's attainable to I do almost too. anybody. Yeah. And so I, I don't do ever want to like allocate to ha- make it $3,000. No. Like just because I'd be willing to pay it doesn't mean I think it should be that. Because that's just like turning it into a, it's just privatizing it, turning it into a rich man's game. Um, yeah, you can go hunt doll sheep for twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 any year you want if you pay it. So yeah. it's just, I, yeah, I don't want it to become that, but. Um, no, I, I don't either. And I, I don't know what that answer is of how you fund these programs for species. And, and then the flip side of that is if there's so few tags, it's really hard to get people to advocate and get excited about it. You know, if you start talking about elk conservation or elk habitat, we all have elk tags every year, so it affects us. So, okay, yeah, I'll show up at that meeting. Yeah. But yeah. when only one out of every 400 people you know has a sheep tag, good luck getting all the other 399 to show up at a meeting. But, yeah, like you said, but with sheep, it's just different. Like, because sheep funding is doing well right now, like in terms of the nonprofits are able to raise a ton of money for wild sheep stuff but uh like you, we made the film mm-hmm. um selfless, selfless mm-hmm. about art and you know how he's never drawn a sheep tag yet he right volunteers and gives his time and money every year to the to the cause sheep. even though he might never draw yeah and so that one is an interesting example but it's all you know like you said if there's not a chance at all would people still feel that same way and then you know it, I think it is this human nature to, if you can potentially, yeah, you know, if you have a chance to go moose sheep or goat hunting some year, you're going to care a little bit more about it. It's this human right. nature. And that, so that becomes a bit of a spiral where fewer tags, less interest and less advocacy because of less interest in funding and advocacy, even fewer tags. And it, it becomes this spiral that's almost, it, the pessimist would say it's the race to zero. So I'm, I'm, I don't want to see that. What do we do? What do we do? Michael, uh, Michael start in the Gyrus Moose Foundation. Yeah. He said, "Yep, Lincoln Bio." <laughs> <laughs> I bet but you it, there's probably something. I was gonna, you think yeah. I say it's like we'll we'll probably find something. Maybe we should just put it in. The- yeah, I'm trying to think. Yeah. And it's no, I know. Do you know what organizations end up with the auction tag? I know Ducks Unlimited. Yeah, it usually the, gets the Montana Moose <laughs> Montana. auction tag. Yeah, That's so. interesting. So if someone knows of a moose organization, let us know. Yeah. I'd be inter- be interested to know. But anyway, so I don't know if we have like a direct call to action. Care more about Care more. Care more about the big three. Congrats, Marcus, on drawing a sheep tag, my dude. Thanks, yeah. I'm, yeah. Gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna be I'm MIA uh, <laughs> every weekend. Yeah. Uh from now until hunting season. I and then once hunting you. season starts, yeah. I will be gone more. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure Marcus is getting a lot of tears about his situation, right? Yeah, the, right the audience right, right, is right. like, oh, Marcus, I feel so bad. Poor guy. <laughs> well, and then I'd love to, I'm, I hope we can tell, we'll we'll be able to tell some sort of story with it in terms of filming it, but just in terms of getting permits in wilderness and everything, we'll have to, we'll have to see how much of it we can film. But I, I have a lot of experience down there and, you know, film the sheep on the winter range and just have a history there, so some really cool stories to tell well whether it's the whole hunt or uh aspect of the hunt well off was yet to be determined but i i i would say if there's anyone whose eyes through which that story of that sheep herd should be told it's this person sitting right over here at the corner of the table agreed i think there's probably some biologists who do a better job than me but okay. i appreciate but, but, that but, I but think. they're not the storyteller <laughs> <that you are, laughs> so. all, all right. right well thanks guys We'll cut it off because our cameras are about to. Yeah, and good luck, you guys, in Alaska. Like, oh, yeah. Good luck out there. Randy's about, we'll Randy and you. Jace are heading to Alaska. I know. I got clearance from the doctor today. I just got back from the surgeon. I didn't tell you guys. I was telling Marcus. He's like, man, for a guy your age, that's about as good a recovery as I've ever seen. Heck, yeah. He's only in his 40s, so I think that's why he says a guy your age. I probably look <laughs> older. Than him, so. Well, but. good luck out there, and uh, thanks for having us on here. Oh, yeah. Thanks, guys. See you.